out there to you guys. Uh, just so that the, the reminder, uh, some of the mandates are back in place for us in this in this county and in, in our state, and so we want to make sure that we abide by those. And uh, so while you're in the service, we just ask that you keep your mask on. Um, and then as you're leaving and different things, uh, try to try to get outside. Just be safe about it. Um, during these during, during these interesting times, I think that's the, probably the best word is interesting. Um, just kind of keep keep safe. Uh, help others stay safe as well. Um, this week we have a time of prayer on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Uh, if you have any prayer requests for that, you can email them to the church email at gracechurch at clintongrace.org. Uh, we need those in by Tuesday at noon so that we can pray for them an hour later at 1. So that's like the last minute requests can come in by noon. Um, just a, a special prayer that you can keep in mind this week. I kind of mentioned it in the, in the intro here. Um, pray for our GBCS, Grace Brother Christian School Ministry. Uh, pray for our administrators. Pray for our teachers, our staff, and our students um, as they prepare for a new school year. And I said, you know, teachers have been in the building. Uh, new teachers started last Monday, and new, uh, the returning teachers started this past Wednesday, and they're continuing on. They'll be in the building tomorrow and Tuesday, and then Wednesday they will start with students. So um, we do have a lot more students coming in the building this year. So be praying for that as well, uh, for safety and health of everyone that's going to be here. And uh, we just, we're, we're really excited. I can tell you that the teachers are really excited about this new school year, uh, some of the changes that have happened, some of the changes that are going to happen that are uh, really exciting as well. So uh, just be praying for our school ministry. Um, as well as in our school ministry, we are looking for a couple positions um, for the school ministry. Now, they have everything covered at the moment, um, but by being covered, they also lost um, they also lo lost a substitute in the making of that. Um, so we're looking for some substitutes to come in. If, if you have uh, teaching experience or you need to, you want to come in and help the school ministry that way, we'd love to have you come in. Uh, and they're also looking for an elementary specials teacher. Now, this, this is a fun position because it's K3 to K5. You're teaching them music and uh, monitoring lunch duty and stuff like that. But it's a full-time position. Um, and so they're looking for that. That's like kind of the last key. They have that covered by somebody that's been at the school for a long time. Um, but they'd like to hire for that position as well. Um, so applications can be... You know, turned into the administrative office um, with Sue Gilmore, um, and you can call the, the church and school to be able to do that. All right, uh, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. So uh, if you're watching at home, that's the cue to go get your supplies uh, for Communion. And um, if you're here with us, that's a cue to you to pick up your Communion supplies on the way into the sanctuary next week. Uh, they'll be right outside the uh, sanctuary door there. Uh, we have a financial seminar coming up on September 25th. It's from 8.30 to 12.30. It's a, it's a hybrid, so you can, you can participate from home or in the building. Um, but you do need to register for that. Um, so if you want to sign up, just email us at the church or call us at the church, and we'll be getting you on a list for that as well. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, next week our children's ministry will start Sunday school and church time. Uh, through the summer, we've, we've just done church time, and that's been uh, nice, um, but we will have two opportunities for, you know, maybe you as parents want to come and participate in a Sunday school class or whatever, your children will be able to go into a Sunday school class next week, so be, be ready for that, and uh, we're starting uh, a new ra uh, round of new curriculum for our kids, so I'm really excited to introduce a new character uh, trait and a new character, cartoon character next week, Charlie the Cardinal. So the kids will want to be here f uh, to get some prizes that have Charlie the Cardinal on them and things like that. So be ready for that next week. Uh, as well as online giving, if you are at home and watching and you want to be able to make sure that you're tithing and giving, uh, you can do that uh, on our website by going to the Give button. And also, you can text to give by texting Clinton Grace, all one word, to 77977. Um, and if you're in the building, it makes it easy. There's some plates on the way out. Uh, if you want to drop off your offering on the way out, we'd appreciate that. And also, if you're visiting with us uh, today 
or if you're visiting with us online, we would like you to kind of fill out a, um, a form for us just so we can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, there's some in the back of the chairs, and there's also online. There is an online form that you can do the same thing. So we'd appreciate connecting with you and checking in with you afterwards. As well as stay connected, go to our website. Our website's kind of a big hub of information and uh, a lot of cool stuff on there um, for kids, for teenagers, the whole deal. Um, but we would really appreciate you checking out the website and staying in touch with all of us. Uh, I'm going to turn things over now to our worship team. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in, in worship. Uh, would you bow in prayer with me? Father, today we thank you. We praise you because you are worthy of praise. We honor you, Lord God. We claim, Lord God, that you are holy. You are not just holy, but you are holy, holy, holy. And you stand alone, Lord God, to be exalted, to be worshiped, we thank you for the privilege we have of worshiping you. Father, as we come together to worship, we want to bring requests to you. So I want to pray for the Mako family right now. And I pray, Lord God, you would give grace. I pray for the Sharace family. I pray for many families who have loved ones who are sick or, or loved ones, Lord God, who have gone to be with you. We lift them up. We pray you, Lord God, encourage them. We pray you pour your mercy and your grace upon them. Fathers, we look at starting a new school year next year. I pray for our school ministry. I thank you for those that you have brought into the ministry. And I pray as the students come in, Lord God, that they may sense your love and may sense your presence. And we just want to commit this school year to you for your glory and honor. Lord, we cry out for those who are in Afghanistan and we pray, Lord God, for the citizen, citizens there, that you'd get them out. We pray that you keep them protected. We pray for our president and vice president. We pray, Lord God, for safety. We cry out for wisdom. We pray that you would bring godly people into their lives that would give them godly advice, and they would heed that advice. And so we thank and praise you because you tell us to pray for our, our leaders. But Lord God, our trust is in you. Because we believe that you are ultimately in control. And we love you and praise you. And as we open your word now to hear your word, I pray that you would capture the hearts of every single one here. That you would remove every distraction, anything that would stop, Lord God, your word from doing what you called it to do. I pray that you take your holy word by the person of the Holy Spirit. And in spite of me, you'd use it for your glory. And we'll be sure to give you all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, praise God. We're so glad you are here this morning. For those of you who are watching online, uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, for worshiping with us. I know uh, Pastor Hunt mentioned last week about the VBS, and I just want to say uh, also, I just want to give a special thanks to all of those who served in VBS, those who came out, those who, who took kids to the bathroom, whatever you did, I want to thank you for that. It was, and, and, and please understand, your labor is not in vain. You are reaching kids with the word of God. And so I want to thank every single one of you. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to do that. But I do want to put our hands together and thank those people who did that. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We are making our way through the book of 1 John. Our theme this year is loving one another. And so 1 John's theme is the inspection, our fellowship inspection. God wants to inspect our fellowship. And today we're talking about something that is, that is vital, that is really, really important. And, 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 and it's one of my concerns uh, in my own life, one of my concerns as a pastor, we're talking about this area of overcoming, of being victorious, of being conquerors, 
in the Christian life. And one of my concerns is this, that in my life, in the lives of Christians, many of us are not living as victorious as God would want us to live. And we're going to talk about today really what that means. But I, I, I want you to do this. Find somewhere, you have a piece of paper or something. I want you to do this. On a scale from 1 to 10, how would you rank your daily victory in Christ? Your ability to live victorious in this life. Now we understand one day we're going to get to heaven and we're going to have victory, right? But God wants us to be victorious now. How would you rank your, your daily victorious living in this life on earth? On a scale from 1 to 10. 10 being great. 10 being great, 1 meaning you're bombing out. You're struggling. Where would you rate yourself on that scale? And be honest. Now, before you put down 10... Let me just say to you that the Apostle Paul was not a 10. The Apostle Paul said, the thing that I should do, I don't do, and the thing that I don't do, are those things I am doing. So please, please if, you, if you put down 10, you just erase that right now, okay? <laughs> How would you rank yourself in the area of living a victorious Christian life every day? And so what John does this morning, as we look in this, John gives us four characteristics of an overcomer, of an overcomer, four characteristics of an overcomer, and we're going to look at this, but we're really going to concentrate on the last one that he gives, but we're going to mention all of these, and so he says in verse 5, verse 1 of chapter 5, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. The first characteristic is this, they're born of God. They're born of God. Belief in Jesus Christ equals being born of God. Now we talk about this area of belief. This is not an intellectual knowledge or assessment of something. When we don't look at the word belief in the Bible, it means to totally trust, to totally rely on something. It means to wholeheartedly dedicate your life to something. That's what belief means. So those who are totally trusting God for their salvation, totally relying on God for their salvation, have totally dedicated their lives to Christ, he says, they are born again. John chapter 3, in John chapter 3, verse 3, it says this, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so this, again, this is more than intellectual. In fact, the Bible says this in James. James he says this. He says, even the demons believe in Christ. But it's not salvation. So it has to be more than just a, a head knowledge. So when you came to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and said, I believe that he is who he says he is, and that he died for me and rose again, when you accepted that truth, you were then born again. Jesus says, why, why do you marvel that you must be born again? Ephesians says it this way. Ephesians says that, that we were quickened. We were made alive. You, you, you were born again. You were made alive. And so when you were saved, you were born in God. And so one of the qualifications of an overcomer is that you must be saved. Does that make sense? You, you must be saved. One of the qualifications of an overcomer is that you must be saved. But the second part of verse 1 gives us a second characteristic of an overcomer. And everyone who loves the Father, and, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. But the second characteristic of an overcomer is that they love. And we've been talking about this, right? We've been talking about this whole, whole series. Pastor, uh, Minister Josh mentioned this last week. We've been talking about this idea of love because that's our theme, is loving one another. And so everyone who is born of God loves. Those who are born of God love God 
and love others. And so there's this issue of love. And, and, and so who does it say that we're to love? He says in the, in the part, he says, and everyone who loves God, the Father, loves whoever has been born of him. And so everyone else who has come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, I'm to love. It's not based on education. It's not based on social status. It's not based on what denomination they are. It's not based on what kind of Bible they read. It's not based on their political association. It's not based on any of that. If you have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, if you have born again, if you believe Jesus died for you and rose again, you are my brother and sister, and I have a responsibility to love you. And that love is not based on performance. Now sometimes, well, let, 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 me just, let me just check this guy out a little bit, see how he walks, right? And if he walks right, I might love him. It's not based on a performance. It's not based on anything that that person has done to earn that love. Because of the truth, no, none of us deserve God's love, right? We couldn't have, we couldn't have earned God's love. And so because that brother or sister is a brother and sister in Christ, God says that I am to love them. An overcomer loves. An overcomer loves. Everyone who loves God will also love Christ and love others. And I want you to understand this. This is, this is and we miss this sometimes. This is a part of how I love God. I love God by loving his children. When I am showing love to my brother and sister in Christ, I am actually showing God, love to God. I'm actually loving God. I'm actually serving God when I am serving his children. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 says this, And we say, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now look at verse 4, chapter 4. Look at verse chapter 4, verse 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is what? A liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot possibly love God whom he has not seen. And this is the command we have from him. Whoever loves God must love his brother. There's no question. If I, if I say that I love God, I've got to love you. If you say that you love God, you have to love me. And if I say that I love God and I hate my brother, John says, and John, John, I love John. Because th th there's no pulling punches with John. Every day is black and white. If you say you love God and you hate your brother, you are a liar. You don't love God. If you hate your brother. John, John just calls it the way it is. And so the, our idea there is that we are to love. The characteristic of an overcomer is that they love. The second, third characteristic of an overcomer is in verse 2. In verse 3. For this is love. This is the love of God. That we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. So this is the love of God. The third characteristic of an overcomer is obedience. Is obedience. Now that's something that we don't talk a lot about today because we have this optional Christianity. This suggestive Christianity. You know, whatever you feel like doing, God just suggests these things. If you want to do them, you can. If you don't want to do them, don't worry about it. He's not going to be upset about it. No, the, the, the third characteristic of someone who's an overcomer is obedience is they learn to, they, they, they learn to obey. And so the idea there is that we, my love for God involves obedience, and that obedience is to love his children. First John, I'm sorry, John chapter 14, verse 15 says this. If you love me, obey my commands. You can't get any more simple than that. Jesus saying, here's Jesus saying, I'm going to do a love test. My love test is not how often you show up at church. My love test is not how loud you sing. 
My love test is not how much money you give. My love test, the test I use to find out whether you are loving me, is are you obeying me? We can talk all the love we want. If our life is not a life of obedience, we're not demonstrating to God that we love him. And so it must be a life of, of obedience. Look at um, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Let me just read that. 1 John 2, 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commands is a what? A liar. And the truth is not in him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment, his primary command, his number one command, that we believe in the name of Jesus, the Son of, we believe in his name, believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and we love on one another just as he has commanded us. Chapter 3, verse 23. And so, a thing of an overcomer is he must love. And he says there, he says, he says, and his, and his commands are not burdensome. They're not heavy. They're not weighty. They're, they're, not, they're not grievous, is what he's saying. You know, sometimes we have this, this idea that God gives us all these commands and rules because he, he just wants to spoil our fun. He's like a killjoy. He's like a kill fun. He puts all these rules and things in front of us because he just doesn't want us to have fun. He wants us to be serious. No. His commands are not grievous. They're not burdensome. See, this is what I, I've come to believe. The commands of God are not burdensome to those who love him. Amen. When you love God, his commands are not burdensome. That, 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 that mother who gets up in the morning at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning to feed her baby or to change her baby, is she tired? Yes, she's tired. But you know what? That's not burdensome. Because that's love. See, when you love someone, when they, have, when, you, when they have a need and you feel the need, when they have a command, you do it because of love. Which is different than what the leaders of that day had. Because what happened was this. God had all these commands and the, the Jewish leader, leaders added extra commands. They added extra rules. And so you had, now you had to do this, but now you've got to wash your hands a certain way. And now you've got to do this. They added all of these rules which were a burden. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 4, let me just read it. He says, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their own finger. They made all these different rules and said, you've got to follow these rules. But they're not even following themselves. And so they laid burdens on people. See, that, that, that is what religion is. Religion is burdensome. Religion is men trying to please God in their own strength with rules. And the more rules you have, the more burdensome religion is. That's the difference between a religion and a relationship. Amen? See, when you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're in a relationship. You realize you don't have to do a whole bunch of things to try to win favor with God or to be strong with God because God loves you anyhow. But you do it because you love him. You do it out of love. He says there in verse 3 and verse 2, he says this. He says, by this we know that we are the children of God when we love God, obey his commandments. For this is love. For this is the love of God. That we keep his commandments. And the word keep there has the idea, that the, the nuance there is the idea of consistent obedience. It's not a one-time obedience. It's something that we live out consistently, that we keep his commandments, is what he says there. So he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So here's the issue. If I'm not keeping the commandments of God, then my love for God is in question. Right? I'm loving me more than I'm loving God. If I'm not keeping the commandments of God, my love for God is in question. So it, it sort of goes full circle. 
My obedience is proof of my love. And my love is proof of my faith. Because if I love, if I have faith, I'm going to love God, I'm going to love others. So my obedience is the proof of my love. And my love is the proof, proof of my faith. So that's the third one. Let's, let's go to the, the fourth one. This is where we're going to spend most of our time at. The fourth characteristic of an overcomer. Verses 4 and 5. The first characteristic of an overcomer is this. It is our continual faith. Verse 4 says, And everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. It is a continuum of our faith. Now, I mentioned before, I may have forgot to mention, in chapter 1, in verse 1, where it says belief, it is, the, the idea there, the verb that's used there, is a continual belief. Not a one-time belief, but a belief that continues to demonstrate faith. And so what he's saying here is this, this, this is, this is the continual, continuation of our faith, is what he's saying there. If you are born of God, look what he says, verse, verse 4, if everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Now, this word overcome means to conquer. It means to prevail. It means to have victory. It means to have, it means to have conquering power. Now, who has conquering power? Everyone who is born of God has overcome. We, we really need to get this. Conquering and victory is not set aside for a certain group of people. You get that? It's almost like, it's, you know... You have to live and you have to reach a certain level, almost like a game. Once you reach a certain level, you know, you've conquered. It's not you reach a certain level and now you're an overcomer. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, everyone who is born of God is an overcomer, is a conqueror, is a victor. You're going to say, but yeah, Pastor, I, I know, I know, but the, I, I, I understand everybody else, but you just don't know my situation. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm struggling with. You don't know my habits. Everyone who is born of God is an overcomer. I didn't say that. John said it, right? Is that what John said? Is that what he's saying? He's saying everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Now, that, that, verse, that word there, overcome, is in the present active indicative. And what that means is, it is a continual, situa it's a continual action. Everyone who is born of God keeps overcoming, continues to overcome. It's not a one-time thing. It continues to overcome. That's, what, that's, what, that's, what, that's what, uh, what John is saying. He continues to overcome. So if you are a Christian, you are an overcomer. It looks at, he goes on in verse 4. And everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world. That word victory means this is the conquest. This is the means of success. This is how you overcome. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Oftentimes that word is used in athletics, it's used in, in, in military battles, used in the courtroom. It has the idea of, of, of having victory. One of the commentators says this, that word victory always involves conflict and test. John is calling his readers to overcome or triumph in the face of opposition, persecution, temptation, and possibly martyrdom. See, see the thing is, we want to have victory. We want to be overcomers, but we don't want no conflict. Amen. We don't want no test. Amen. We just want to have victory. That word means that in order to have victory, you have to have conflict. You have to have test. You have to have, you have, to have opposition is what, he, what he's saying there. But we don't want that conflict. 
So you have two words there, and they're very interesting words. The, the, the idea of, of overcome suggests conflict. The idea of the, 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 the idea of overcome suggests conflict. The idea of victory implies combat. We're in a fight. And you've got to have tests to have victory. Hang your Bibles and turn to John 16. Turn to John 16. Is, is this making sense? Is it making sense? Okay. I'm, 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 I'm going to let you know. I'm, this, this is so important. And as believers, we have to get this. John chapter 16. John 16. We're talking about overcoming. And the Bible says that you and I are overcomers. Look at verse 33 of John 16. He says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. No matter what you're going through, you have peace. In this world, you might have tribulation. Is that what it says? He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. I have already conquered the world. I have already prevailed over the world. So you take heart, even though you may have some tribulation, the world's been defeated. That's what he's saying there. Jesus says the world has been defeated. That world, the idea of the world is the world system. The system that is controlled by Satan. This system that is, that, that, that is geared toward deception and, and, and disobedience. He says, I have already defeated this world. This demonic system, this evil system. He says, I've already conquered it. I've already won victory over this system. And here's the thing. We are overcomers because we share in his victory. Get that? I'm not overcoming because of me. I'm overcoming because I have the privilege of sharing in Christ's victory. You know, it's, it's sort of always been amazing to me. Um, how many of you are sports fans? Okay, we, we got some sports fans. So, a few years ago when the Nationals won the World Series, right? How many of you went jumping around saying, we won? <laughs> we won! We won! We won! Right? You didn't go to one spring training. You never got on the field. You never swung a bat. You never lifted weights. You never, you, you never, tra you never got hurt and had to be rehabbed. You never hired anybody and put a team together, but yet we won, didn't we? Christ's victory is our victory because we are in Christ. And here's the thing. There is absolutely nothing that I can do to subtract from Christ's victory. If I fall and fail and fall on my face, it doesn't take away Christ's victory. And there's nothing that you and I can do to add to Christ's victory. He won victory, and because we are in Christ, we are overcomers, and we are victorious because we're in Christ. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you some verses. I, I, I really think this is what, as believers, this is what we need to get. We, we, we need to get this. Let me give you, give, give you some verses. Romans 8, 37. This should come up on the screen. No, in all these things, all these things he mentioned before, all these trials, persecution, all these things that happened, in all these things, we are more hyper- than conquerors through him who loved us. What I'm talking about is not, I'm not talking about what we say about ourselves, I'm talking about what God says about us. He says we are more than conquerors. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God because he's the one who's given us the victory. He's made us conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us to a triumphal procession 
and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere, who always leads it. Now, the, the idea there is, is, is the idea of a victory parade. And what would happen when a, when a Roman general would win a victory, they would throw a parade, and they would put rose petals all over the streets, and when the horses came and stumbled on the rose petals, it gave off a fragrance. And he would come in his horse in this victory parade, and then his sons oftentimes, and his other soldiers would follow him on those horses. His sons became a part of his victory parade. And oftentimes what he would do, he may even have some of the prisoners that he had captured in chains following the parade. And so he says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphant procession. Always leads us. God has made us a part of his victory parade is what he's saying there. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. I write to you fathers because you know him who's from the beginning. I write to you young, young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. You've overcome Satan. You've overcome circumstances. You've overcome the world. You've overcome the evil one. 1 John 4, 4. We talked about that one. 1 John 4, 4. Little children, you are from God and you have overcome. You have conquered. You are victorious. For he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Is, 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 is there a theme here? Is, is something God wants us to get? This is what he wants us to get. We've overcome. If you are born of God, you are victorious. You are a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. You have overcome is what he's saying. And the sad thing, so many of us are living defeated lives because we don't understand what God says Amen. about us. Now look what he goes on and says, in verse 4, back in 1 John, back in 1 John, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even your faith. Now, I mentioned the first overcome there is, is, a, is a present tense, meaning it's a continual thing. The second word that he uses there, who he says, where he says um, and, and this is the victory that overcomes, is a different tense. And it's a participle, and it is, it is an aorist active tense. And what that means is this. It is an individual action. It is an individual experience. Now, I'm not talking individual as far as us as an individual. What, 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 he's, what, what he's actually saying is there. He's saying this. And this victory, this means to success that allows you to overcome and conquer each situation, each opposition, each trial, each individual trial, and to meet each temptation with victory. It's a different tense. And so what he's saying, he, what John does, he breaks it down. And he's saying, God has given us this, 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 this thing, that what I'm telling you, the means in which we're going to do this, we're going to be able to meet each temptation, each opposition, each trial, everything that comes upon us, we're going to be able to meet this. And look what he says. How is that? How, how, how do we do that? Our faith. Our faith is what he says is our faith. He says, this is the victory that has overcome the world. It is your faith. Now, again, your faith must be in the right thing. A lot of us put faith in a lot of stuff. We put faith in what the church is. We put faith in what people say. We put faith in, in a lot of things. But the faith must be in Christ. And it must be in his word. But this is the thing that's going to give us victory over all these things. It's our faith. Now again, we mentioned before, faith is not intellectual belief. Faith has to do with having confidence in. It has to do with confiding in, in trusting, in relying on. Faith has to do with commitment to. That's the faith. And I want you to know, he's not talking about a different kind of faith. 
This is the same faith that he talked about in verse 1, in belief. This is not a different type of faith that once you get along, once you've been saved for a while, God gives you some kind of different kind of faith that does this. This is the same faith. It's a continuation of that faith. So the faith that saved you will continue to give you victory. The faith that saved you will continue to give you victory. Hebrews 11.1 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of what I hope for and it is the conviction of what I don't see yet. That's what faith, that's the definition it gives. Faith is simply this. Faith is believing what God says. That's faith. It's believing what God says is true. That's what faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 20, talking about Abraham in, 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 Rome, in Romans 4. Let me, let me just read that. Let me just read it real quick because I don't want to mis, I don't want to misquote it. I don't want to misquote it. Romans 4, 20. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but grew strong in his faith, and he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That's faith. Faith is being fully convinced that if God said something, it's true. That God says something, it's true. Even though I may not see it, even though the circumstances would dictate otherwise, if God said it, I can believe it because it's true. Now, you know it's true whether I believe it or not, right? But if God said it, I believe it, and it is true. That is what faith is. Faith is believing that. Faith is an essential part of the armor of God. We're talking about combat, right? So to turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Folks, I, I, I want you to know, we, we've got to get this. We have to get this in our spirits. We've got to understand what God says about us being overcomers and conquerors and start living a victorious life. One of these days, I'm, 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 I'm going to do a, seri a series on, on, on the victorious Christian life. But it, it is so needed. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And many of us are familiar with this verse in chapter 6. Chapter 6 talks about the armor of God. And he says there, I want you to know you're in a battle. You're in a fight. It's not flesh and blood. We're in a battle. And our goal there is to stand. That's our goal in this battle. It's to stand. It's to withstand the battle is what he says. And then he goes on to describe the armor. He goes on to describe the armor that God has given us for this battle in Ephesians chapter 6. He says there in verse 13, Therefore take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all. Stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, which is integrity, is truth in the God's word. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is being righteous in all of your interactions with people. That's the best way of righteousness. Having your feet, ha having, having put on the ready, having, having shoes for your feet and having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. He says, I'm going to give you some shoes that are going to allow you to stand and have peace in every single circumstance. Look at the next thing he says there. And in all circumstances, Take up the shield of faith with which you will, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And in every single circumstance, in every single trial, every single opposition, in every circumstance, take the shield of faith. What is faith? For faith is believing what God says. And when you do that, you will, be able to, you, you will be able to go against every single attack or dart that Satan is going to bring at you. Every opposition, every trial, every persecution, with the shield of faith, you're going to be able to get victory over it. That's what he's saying. But it's believing what God said. And so what, what, that, what that means is this. I have to mentally say, 
I'm going to believe what God says and not what Satan says. I'm going to believe what God says and not what the world says. I'm going to believe what God says and not what I say. Because sometimes we're our biggest enemy, aren't we? Sometimes it's the self-talk that goes on in me that is contrary to what God says. And I've got to put my thoughts in check. I've got to put my thought. I'm going to believe what God says no matter what I feel. I don't feel this, but you know what? God says this. No matter what the circumstances are, I'm going to believe what God says. Even though the circumstances are contrary to what God said, I'm going to believe what God says. And so saying, I'm going to take God at his word even though I don't see it, even though I don't feel it, even though other people are saying, you can't do this. You're not good enough. You can't. And even your mind, yourself, you're saying it yourself. I can't do this. I'm, I'm, I'm incapable of doing this. But God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? So I've got to take the word of God. Where does our victory come from? How are we getting this victory? How are we getting overcoming? It comes by our faith. Believing what God says. Warren Risby says this, faith is not simply saying that what God says is true or believing it is true. True faith is acting on what God says is true. It's not believing, not just believing, but it's acting on what God said is true. Faith is, faith is not believing in spite of evidence, it's obeying in spite of consequences. Hebrews chapter 11, you have the Hall of Fame of Faith. You have all these people listed in this Hall of Fame of Faith. They didn't just get there. They had faith. But what don't you know about them about their faith? Their faith was not just something they believed. Their faith was something they acted on. Faith that is not acted on is not faith. That's, that's, why, that's why James says this. Show me, show, show me your faith and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith must also have action that demonstrates the faith that I have. So, what is, what is John trying to tell us? One commentator said it this way, I think the best way to do it is read it. You Christians do not have to walk around defeated because Christ has made you victors. He has defeated every enemy. He's defeated death, he's defeated grave, he's defeated sin, he's defeated Satan, he's defeated the demons in hell, he's defeated the world. He has defeated every, every enemy, and you share in his victory. Now by faith, claim your victory. Live your victory. Claim, claim, claim your victory. In fact, John says in, 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 verses, in verses 4 and verses 5, John tells us, he uses the word overcome three times in those two verses. Why does he do that? Because there's something here John wants us to get. We're overcomers. We're overcomers. Now, overcomers doesn't mean that we're perfect. doesn't mean that we don't fall, but it means that we are overcomers. Turn to, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're almost done. Ephesians chapter 1. I want to I, I read Paul's prayer for us. Ephesians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 15. I remember my, 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 my pastor uh, that I grew up under um, was a, was a, was a uh, gifted preacher. And uh, I remember he was preaching somewhere at another church, and he started preaching. Now, have you ever been, have you ever been to uh, some black churches? And I saw some white churches, too. When they get to the end of the message, somebody gets on the organ. You ever, you ever seen that? And they say something like, da-da-da. And they get on the organ and do that thing. And so he was preaching one time, and, and, and a young man got on the organ. He was in his, in his message. And he said to the young man, he said, he said, young man, son, God's word don't need no help. <laughs> 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 and 
Amen? God's word don't need no help. Look what, look what Paul says in Ephesians 1. He says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord, Jesus, and your love toward one another, you have a testimony. You, you have faith, and your faith is being proved by your love. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation of revelation in the knowledge of him. I want, I'm praying that you would know God. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you have been called. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? He said, I'm praying three things. That you may know the hope of your calling, the reason God called you, and you may know what is the hope and the riches that are in God. Verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? I want you to know what power is available to you. Now he tells us in verse 20. According, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Don't miss that. But please don't miss that. What Paul is saying is this. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that he has made available to you and I. That's deep. The same power. He goes on to say this. He says, he says, he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of heavenly places far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion. He's seated him at the right hand and he is far above. He is elevated above all rulers above all authority, above all powers. He is elevated above all dominions and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and given him to be the head of all things in the church. You see, see, what, God, see what Paul's saying here? That when Christ rose, when God raised Christ from the dead, he elevated him and he put him in heaven at his right hand. And every power, every ruler, every dominion, every authority is under him. And the idea of he put his feet, when you put your feet on somebody, that means victory. You put your feet on the enemy's neck. Every power and authority, everything that is in this world that would come against you and I, Christ has already won victory and he has dominion over it and it is under his feet. And his victory is my victory. Because I am seated in the heavenlies with Christ. His victory is my victory. People say, but Pastor Clark, you just don't understand. I don't feel victorious. I don't feel like, I, mean, I just feel like I keep failing, I keep doing this. It's not about what you feel. Faith is about what God has said. Regardless of what you feel, regardless of what you think, regardless of what you say to yourself, regardless of what the world says, regardless of what even Christians say to you. I'm going to trust God's word. I'm going to have faith in God's word because if God said it, it is true and I'm going to take action and belief on what God says. And because of that, I am an overcomer because I am in Christ. He's put all things under his feet and he's given him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. But you may be saying, but Pastor Clark, you just don't know how often I fall. You don't know how often I mess up, how often I get tripped up over the same issues, how often I fall to the same temptations. You don't know the kind of oppression and, 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 and the trials that I'm going through. You got to believe God's word. You got to believe God's word. Psalm says this. Psalm 37, verse 23 says this. The steps of a man are established by the Lord. And when he delights in his ways, though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong 
for the Lord upholds his hands. Is John saying that because we're overcomers, there's not going to be times in our life where we fall? There's not going to be times in our life where we mess up, where we blow it, and, and, and there are going to be things in our life that we're struggling to get victory over. We're not going to have victory over. It's going to be tough to get victory over. He's not saying that, but what he's saying is this. Even when you fall, God holds your hand and holds you up. And you are still victorious. See, a lot of it's self-talk. What is it that you say about yourself? What is the self-talk that goes on in your head? What do you say about yourself? Oh, I just, I'm, 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 I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm foolish. I, I, I'm a sinner. I can't do it. What is what self-talk? The self-talk is this. I am a child of God, and I am an overcomer, and God is with me. And God is merciful, and God loves me. And even when I fall, even when I mess up, he picks me up. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 16 says this, For a righteous man falls seven times, and he rises again. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? But a wicked stumbles in times of calamity. A righteous man falls seven times, and he gets back up because God's holding his hand, and God raises him back up. Remember I said this? My victory is not based on me. I add nothing to my victory and I can take nothing away from Christ's victory. I do not subtract anything from Christ's victory because my victory is in Christ. And even when I mess up, God in his mercy and his grace and his love picks me up and says, you're my child and you are an overcomer because you're born of me and you share in my victory. So let me ask you this question. What are the areas in your life where you're struggling? When you looked at those areas, and at the beginning of this, of this message, I told you to mark down from between 1 and 10. And there's certain areas, where, ah, you know, that, that temper, <laughs> that, that anger. That's, I, I, what are the areas where you're struggling? And how does God's word, the truth of God's word, what God says about you, how does that change that? Now, please understand, it may not be overnight, but it's something that you work on. And some of you may have areas that you're struggling in where you need to come along and you need to get some other people to come along and help you with those things. That's the amazing thing about faith in Ephesians chapter, in chapter, in chapter 6. We talked about the shield of faith. Those shields that they had, that the Roman soldiers had, they interlocked. So if you're standing with somebody else, you would lock your shield or their shield, and it would be one big shield. And sometimes we need to interlock, right? We need to get some other people of faith next to us who are going to keep us accountable, who are going to help us get victory over certain things we're getting victory. But the issue is we are overcomers. And God has said we are overcomers. So listen, at home, what, do you, what are some things I want you to discuss at home? Talk about how, how do we make this, this message practical. Number one, if we are truly overcomers, why do so many Christians live defeated lives? Good question, right? Why do we live defeated lives if we're truly overcomers? Number two, Discuss how Christ's victory is our victory. Discuss how Christ's victory is our victory. So, so we, we do this at home. We really, we really plan this uh, to give parents something at the dinner time to discuss with their kids, to discuss the message with their kids. But you don't have to have kids. If you don't have kids, please, please discuss it. Discuss this. Number three, what does true faith look like? Think of biblical examples of faith in action. What does true biblical faith look like? More than just a truth, more than just a belief, but it's action. Where I stepped out in action for God. Father, right now, I, I want to thank you for your word. I thank you for this group. And I know, Lord God, your truth. Your truth is that we are overcomers. If you are born of God, if we're saved, we're an overcomer. We're a conqueror. Help us, Lord God, to trust your word, to believe your word, and to act on your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray. Lord, thank you and praise you for overcoming the world. Because of you, Lord, we can be overcomers as well. And Lord, as we cling to you, as we look to you, as we focus on you, as we hope on you, we can have confidence in your victory. We can have confidence that you will do a great work in our lives. Help us as we believe in you, help us as we trust in you, and as we have faith in you to cling to you even more each day. Help us this week to be the example of an overcomer in our lives to those who we interact with, and even to ourselves sometimes, Lord, to remind ourselves just what you've done for each of us. Help us to love one another and help us to love those that we come in contact with this week and share the hope of Jesus. In Jesus' precious name, amen.